This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Jeff Doolittle. I'm excited to invite John Osterhout as our guest on the show today for a conversation about his book, A Philosophy of Software Design. John Osterhout is a professor of computer science at Stanford University. He created the TCL scripting language and the TK Platform Independent Widget Toolkit. He also led the research group that designed the experimental Sprite operating system and the first log structured file system, and is also the co creator of the Raft consensus algorithm. John's book, A Philosophy of Software Design, provides insights for managing complexity in software systems based on his extensive industry and academic experience. Welcome to the show, John. Hi, glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So in the book, there's 15 design principles, which we may not get to all of them, and we're not going to go through them linearly, but these each come out through various discussions about complexity and, and software system decomposition. But before we dig deeply into the principles themselves, I want to start by asking you, we're talking about design styles. So is there just one good design style or are there many? And, and how do you kind of distinguish those? It's a really interesting question. When I started writing the book, I, I've wondered that myself. And one of the reasons for writing the book was to plant a flag out there and see how many people disagreed with me. And I was curious to see if people would come to me and say, show me, no, I, I do things a totally different way and could actually convince me that in fact their way was also good. Because it seemed possible you know, there are other areas where different design styles all work well. They may be totally different, but each works in its own way. And so it seems possible that could be true for software. So I, I have an open mind about this. But what's interesting is that as the book's been out there a few years and I get feedback on it, so far I'm not hearing anything that would suggest that, for example, the principles in the book are situational or personal and that there are alternate universes that are also valid. And so my current hypothesis, my working hypothesis, is that in fact, there are these absolute principles. But I'd be delighted here if anybody else thinks they have a different universe that also works well. I haven't seen one so far. Well, and just that mindset right there I want to highlight as, as you know, someone who does design, that it, it's more important that you put your ideas out there to be invalidated because you really can't ever prove anything. You can only invalidate a hypothesis. So I love that was your attitude with this book too. You may say things that sound axiomatic, but you're really putting out a theory and asking people and inviting critical feedback and conversation, which is really the only way the discovery of human knowledge works anyway. So in the software development life cycle, when do you design? Oh boy, that's, that may be the most fundamental question in all of software design. Well, as you know, there are many, many approaches to this. In the extreme, you do all your design up front. This has sometimes been caricatured by calling it the waterfall model, although that's a bit of an exaggeration. But, but in the most extreme case, you do all design before any implementation, and then after that, the design is fixed. Well, we know that approach doesn't work very well because one of the problems with software is these systems are so complicated that no human can visualize all of the consequences of a design decision. You simply cannot design a computer system up front, a system with any size, and get it right. There will be mistakes. And so you have to be prepared to fix those. If you're not going to fix them, then you're going to pay tremendous costs in terms of complexity and bugs and so on. So you have to be prepared to do some redesign after the fact. Then there's the other extreme. Uh, so people have recognized this, that we should do design in more and more of an iterative fashion. Do a little bit of design, a little bit of coding, and then some redesign, a little bit more coding. And that can get taken to the extreme where you essentially do no design at all. You just start coding and you fix bugs. This is sort of design by debugging. That would be a, maybe an extreme caricature of the Agile model. It sometimes feels like it's becoming so extreme that there's no design at all. And that's wrong also. And so the truth is somewhere in between. I can't give you a precise formula for exactly when, but, but as you do a bit of design up to the point where you really can't visualize what's going to happen anymore. And then you have to build and see the consequences. And then you have, may have to go back and fix some old design. And then you add on some more parts and so on. So I think design is a continuous thing that happens throughout a life, the life cycle project. It never ends. You do some at the beginning. It's always going on. As subsystems become more mature, typically you spend less and less time redesigning those. You're not going to rebuild every subsystem every year. But recognize the fact that you may someday discover that even a very old system that you thought was perfect, that had everything right, actually now 
no longer is serving the needs of the system and you have to go back and redesign it. Are there some real world examples that you can pull from that kind of demonstrate this process of, of design or, or maybe things that have happened historically that sort of reflect this this revisiting of design assumptions previously and then tackling them in a different way over time or, or refining designs as we go? Great question. I can answer a slightly different question, which my students often ask me, which is how many times does it take you to get a design right? <laughs> so, okay. It's not quite the same question. So my experience is when I design something, it typically takes about three tries before I get the design right. That I okay. do design, first design, and then I start implementing it. And it typically falls apart very quickly on implementation. So I go back and do a major redesign. And then the second design looks pretty good. But even that one needs additional fine tuning over time. And so the third iteration is fine tuning. And then once you have that, then systems, I think, that those classes or modules tend to stand the test of time pretty well. But now your question was, are there something where, where you have a module that really worked well? I don't even necessarily mean software, by the work. way, right? Like maybe, like maybe real world or, or examples of, of how iterations and designs have changed and, and had to be revisited over time. Well, I think the classic cause of that is technology change. That when the underlying technologies for how we build something change, often that will change what designs are appropriate. And so, for example, in cars, we're seeing this with the advent of electrical vehicles. That's changing all sorts of other aspects of the design of cars, like the structure of the car changes now because the main structural element is this battery that lives in this very flat, heavy thing at the bottom of the car that has a fundamental impact on the design of the car. Or another example is the, the rise of large screen displays. And now we're seeing the instrument clusters in cars changing fundamentally because there's this large display that is, is replacing a lot of other stuff. And of course, in computers, you know, we've seen design change with, with radical new technologies. The advent of the personal computer caused a whole bunch of new design issues to come along. And the arrival of networks and the web, again, changed a whole bunch of design issues. So technology, I think, has a very big impact on design. Yeah. And you mentioned cars. You know, if you think about the last hundred and what's it been, 140 years, maybe since the first bespoke automobiles were, were created. And the technology certainly has changed from horses and buggies or horseless carriages to to what we have now. And I think definitely software has is, is experienced that as well. You know, not, now with distributed cloud technologies, that's just a whole nother rethinking of how things are designed in, in order to tackle the, the challenges of complexity on complexity that <laughs> distributed systems in the cloud seem to introduce. So speaking of complexity, there's a few principles in the book that specifically relate to complexity. So in your experience, you know, you, you've said a few things like, for example, we need to recognize that complexity is incremental and you have to sweat the small stuff. And you mentioned another principle of pulling complexity downward. So first, maybe speak a little bit about the nature of complexity and how that affects software systems. And then let's explore these, these design principles in a little more detail. Yes. So first, let me, let me first make clear about what I think is the Uber principle. Hmm. You know, the, the one principle to rule, the all, rule them all <laughs> is complexity. That's, I mean, that's, to me, that's what design is all about. That's the fundamental, that we're trying to build systems that limit their complexity. Because, and the reason for that is that the only thing that limits what we can build in software is complexity, really. That's the fundamental limit, is our ability to understand the systems. That we're, the computer system will allow us to build software systems that are far too large for us to understand. Memory sizes are large enough, processors are fast enough. We can build systems that could have tremendous functionality if only we could understand them well enough to make these systems work. So everything is about complexity. So, so by the way, all of the principles in the book are all about managing complexities. complexity. And I would also say that if you ever get to a point where it seems like one of these principles I've put forward conflicts with complexity, with managing complexity. Go with managing complexity. Then the, the principle is a bad principle for that situation. So I, I just want to say before we start, that's, that's the overall thing. So everything else relates to that in some way. Then the second thing, I think the thing that's important to realize about complexity is that it is incremental. That is, it isn't that you make one fundamental mistake that causes your system's complexity to grow without bound. It's, it's lots of little things. And often things that you think, this isn't that big of a deal. I'm not going to sweat this issue. It's, it's only a little thing. Yeah, I, I know it's a kludge, but it's not really big. This won't matter. And of course, no one of them matters. That's true. But the problem is that you're doing dozens of them a week, and each of the 100 other programmers on your project is doing dozens of them a week, and together they add up. And so, so what that means is that 
once complexity arises also, it's extremely difficult to get rid of it because there's no single fix. There isn't one thing you can go back and change that will get rid of all that complexity that's been accumulated over the years. You have to change hundreds or thousands of things, and most organizations don't have the courage and level of commitment to go back and make major changes like that. So then you just end up living with it forever. Well, and you mentioned before the human propensity to go for the short term. And I imagine that has a significant impact here as well. So you say complexity is incremental. You have to sweat the small stuff. So how much sweating is appropriate? And how do you avoid, say, analysis paralysis? Or or I don't know, I, I just imagine people saying there's they're concerned that all progress will halt if we stop to worry about the incremental addition of complexity. How do you how do you fend that off or, or deal with that? First, I'm sure people make those arguments. I'm sure a lot of people say to their bosses, well, do you want me to go back and clean up this code or do you want me to meet my deadline for this Friday? And almost all bosses will say, okay, I guess we have to meet the deadline for this Friday. The question I would ask is, how much can you afford? Think of it like an investment, that you're going to spend a little bit more time today to improve the design, to keep complexity from creeping in. And then in return, you're going to save time later. So it's like this investment is returning interest in the future. What I would argue is how much, I would ask is how much can you afford to invest? Could you afford to let your schedules slip 5 or 10%? Every schedule is going to be 5 or 10% slower than we might have thought, but we're going to get a much better design. And then the question is, well, that maybe that will actually gain you back more than 5 or 10%. Maybe with that better design, you'll actually run, you'll code twice as fast in the future. And so it has more than paid for itself. Now, the challenge with this argument is no one's ever been able to quantify how much you get back from the good design. And so I believe it's actually significant, far more than the cost, the extra cost of trying to make your design better. And I think many people believe that, but no one's been able to do experiments that can prove that. Maybe that's also another one of the reasons why people put off doing the design, because I can, I can measure the 5% slip in my current deadline. I can't measure the 50% or 100% faster coding that we get in the future. Yeah. And this is where I start to think about characteristics like quality, because from my perspective, a quality problem is when you're having to worry about something that you shouldn't have had to worry about. So, you know, you mentioned cars before, right? So what's a quality problem in a car? Well, there's something that is now your concern as a driver that should not be your concern. But what's interesting too, is there's scheduled maintenance for a car. And so putting that off for too long is going to lead not to a quality problem because of the manufacturer, but it's going to lead to a quality problem because of your negligence. And I wonder if you think a similar thing applies to software where this, if we're negligent, maybe we can't immediately measure the effects of that, but downstream, we can measure it in terms of pain. I still fear it's hard to measure it, but I agree with the notion of scheduled maintenance. That I understand there are practical realities. Sometimes some things just have to get done and get done fast. You know, a, a critical bug that has your customers offline. They're not going to be very comfortable with this argument that, well, it's going to take us a couple of extra weeks because we want to make sure our design is good for our projects two years from now. So I recognize that. I understand people have to work under real world constraints. But then I would say, try and find some time, some budget, where later on people can come back and clean things up. After you hit the deadline, maybe the next week is used to clean up some of the problems that you knew you had introduced at the last minute. Or some fraction of your team, 5 or 10%, their job is to go back and do code cleanups rather than writing new code. And so it's not an all or nothing. You don't have to stop the world. And I argue you, you don't have to do heroics to have great design. It's just in the same way that complexity builds up piece by piece, you can do good design piece by piece. Lots of little steps you take along the way to make the design a little bit better. You don't have to fix everything all at once. So that's the incremental factor, meaning complexity is incremental, but it sounds like you're saying we can also incrementally address it as we go. So another principle regarding complexity, you, you mentioned pulling complexity downward. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means and, and how people apply that principle? Yes, actually, I, I originally had a different name for that. I called it the martyr principle. Okay. <laughs> which and, and People told me that was a little bit too inflammatory, maybe, but I, so I took it out. But I, I still like it. So the, the basic idea, I'm, I'm not referring to religious jihad when I say martyr. Sure. I'm thinking of the definition where a martyr is someone who takes suffering on themselves so that other people can be happier and live a better life. And I think of that's our job as software designers, that we take these big, gnarly problems and try and find solutions to them that are incredibly simple 
and easy for other people to use. And actually, honestly, I don't think of it as suffering. It's actually what makes software fun is solving those hard problems. But, but this idea that pull the hard problems downward as opposed to the other philosophy is, well, as a programmer, I'm just going to solve all the stuff that's easy, and then I'll just punt upwards all the other issues. A classic example is just throwing tons of exceptions for every possible slightly strange condition rather than just figuring out how to handle those conditions so you don't have to throw an exception. And so, and this gets back to managing complexity again. So the idea is that we want to somehow find ways of hiding complexity. So if I can build a module that solves really hard, gnarly problems, maybe it has to have some complexity internally, but it provides this really simple, clean interface for everybody else in the system to use, then that's reducing the overall complexity of the system because only a small number of people will, will be affected by the the complexity inside the module. Yeah, that sounds very similar to what one of my mentors calls technical empathy. I, I can guess what the meaning of that is, that I, I like the idea, yes. Yes, which which personally I call the Homer Simpson principle, where there's this wonderful, and you can find a, a, a GIF of it online somewhere, or not a GIF, but a, a short YouTube video of Homer Simpson with a bottle of vodka in one hand and a bottle of mayonnaise in the other. And, and Marge says, I don't think that's such a good idea. And he says, oh, that's that's a problem for future Homer. Boy, I don't envy that guy. And he proceeds to consume the mayonnaise and vodka. And so the, the irony is, you know, you mentioned carrying the, the suffering, which, of course, in this case, can be fun. Carrying the complexity yourself, right? Embracing the complexity yourself on behalf of others so they don't have to experience it. Ironically, a lot of times when you don't do that, you're not having technical empathy for your future self because you're going to come back and say, oh, I wrote this. <laughs> and then you end up carrying the pain anyway. Actually, another great example of that is configuration parameters. Rather than figure out how to solve a problem, just export 12 dials to the user. Uh. They, they, say, and then and not only are you punting the problem, but you can say, oh, I'm actually doing you a favor because I'm giving you the ability to control all of this so you're going to be able to produce a really great solution for yourself. But oftentimes, I think the reason people export the parameters is because they don't actually have any idea how to set them themselves. And they're somehow hoping that the user will somehow have more knowledge than they do and be able to figure out the right way to set them. But more often than not, in fact, the user has even less knowledge to set those than the designer did. Oh, yeah. And 12 parameters, you know, 12 factorial is somewhere in the tens of billions. <laughs> yeah. So good, good luck figuring out, you know, even with seven, there's 5,040 possible combinations and permutations of those. So yeah, as soon as you export, you know, seven configuration parameters to your end user, you've just made their life incredibly challenging and complex. That's an example of pushing complexity upwards. Hmm. That's Rather perfect. Than me solve the problem, I force my users to solve it. Yeah, and you also mentioned in there exceptions and just throwing exceptions everywhere, which relates to another one of the design principles, which is defining errors and special cases out of existence. So what are some examples of, of how you've applied this or, or seen this principle applied? So first, I need to make a disclaimer on this one. This is a principle that can be applied sometimes, but I have noticed as I see people using it, they often misapply it. So let me first talk about how you can apply it, and then we can talk about how it's, how it's misapplied. But some great examples. One of them was the unset command in the Tickle scripting language. So Tickle has a command, unset, that deletes a variable. When I wrote Tickle, I thought, no one in their right mind would ever delete a variable that doesn't exist. That's got to be an error. And so I threw an exception whenever somebody deletes a variable that doesn't exist. Well, it turns out, People do this all the time. <laughs> like the classic examples, you're in the middle of doing some work, you decide to abort, you want to clean up and delete the variables. But you may not know, remember, you may not know exactly which variables have been created or not. So you just go through and try and delete them all. And so what's ended up happening is that if you look at tickle code, virtually every unset command in tickle is actually encapsulated inside a catch command that will catch the exception and throw it away. So what I should have done was simply redefine the the meaning of the unset command change it instead of deleting a variable it's the new definition is make a variable not exist and if you think about the definition that way then if the variable already doesn't exist you're done there's no problem it's perfectly natural there's no error so that just defines the error out of existence uh, a better an even better example i think is deleting a file so what do you do if somebody wants to delete a file when a file is open well Windows took a really bad approach to this. They said, you can't do that. And so if you've used a Windows system, you've probably been in a situation where 
you tried to delete a file or a program tried to delete a file and you get an error saying, sorry, can't delete file, files in use. And so what do you do? Then you go around, you try and close all the programs that maybe have that file open. I've been at times when it, I couldn't figure out which program had the file open, so I just had to reboot before I could delete the file. And then it turned out it was a daemon that had the file open and the daemon got restarted. So Unix took a, a beautiful approach. To this. It's, it's, it's really a lovely piece of design, which is they said, well, it's no problem. You can delete a file when it's open. What we'll do is we'll remove the directory entry. The file is completely gone as far as the rest of the world is concerned. But we'll actually keep the file around as long as someone has it open. And then when the last process closes the file, then we'll delete it. That's a perfect solution to the problem. Now, people complain about Windows, and so there have been various changes made over the years, and I, I don't remember exactly where Windows stands today, but at one point they had modified it so that, in fact, you could set a flag saying it's okay to delete this file while it's open. And then Windows would do that, but it kept the directory entry around. And so you couldn't create a new file until the file had finally been closed. And then once the file was closed, the file would go away, the directory entry would go away, and then you could it. So a lot of programs like Make, which you know, remove a file and then try and recreate, they wouldn't work. They still wouldn't work if the file was open. So they just kept defining errors, creating new errors that caused problems for people. Whereas Unix had this beautiful solution of just eliminating all possible error conditions. Well, and that is right back to pulling complexity downward, because what do exceptions do? They bubble upward. So by allowing them to bubble up, you're, you're violating that previous principle that we discussed. Now, now, I need to do this disclaimer, though, so people don't go off and make a whole lot of mistakes. I, I mentioned this principle to students in my class. And actually, I'm at the point now where I may, I may even stop mentioning this to the students because for some reason, no matter how much I disclaim this, they, start, they seem to think that they can simply define all errors out of existence. <laughs> and in the first project for my class... Inevitably, there will be it's a project building a network server where there are tons of exceptions that can happen. You know, servers crash, network connections fail. There will be projects that do not throw a single exception or even check for errors. And I'll say, what's going on here? And they'll say, oh, we just defined those all out of existence. <laughs> and I'll say, no, you just ignored them. That's different. <laughs> so, so I do want to say that errors happen you know, most of the time. You have to actually deal with them in some way. But sometimes if you think about it, you can actually define them away. So think of this as a spice, you know, that you use in very small quantities in some places, but if you use it too much, it, it, you end up with something that tastes pretty bad. Yeah. And I remember one of the you know early mistakes that a lot of programmers make when they first get started is empty catch blocks. <laughs> and when you see those littered throughout the code, that is not uh, what you mean when you're saying define errors out of existence. Right. <laughs> you're not saying swallow and ignore, define. I don't think this is one of the design principles, but it triggers in my thinking as well that if there is an exceptional condition, you do want to let it fail fast. In other words, you want to find out and you you want things to stop functioning, like bring, bring it down if there's an exception, and then figure out how to keep it from coming down in the first place instead of just pretending nothing went wrong. Well, this gets at another important thing. One of the most, I think, one of the most important ideas in doing design, which I think is true in any design environment, software or anything else, is you have to decide what's important and what's not important. And if you can't decide, if you think everything is important, or if you think nothing's important, you're going to have a bad design. Good designs pick a few things that they decide are really important, and they emphasize those. You bring those out. You don't hide them. You probably present them up to users. And so in software, software design is the same thing. If an exception really matters, you probably do need to do something. You probably do need to pass it back to users. You probably want to highlight it, make it really clear that this thing happened. And then other things that are less important, then those are the things you try and hide or encapsulate inside a module so that nobody else has to see them. The thing I tell my students over and over again is, what's important? What's the most important thing here? Pick that out. And, and focus your design around that. Yeah, that, and as you mentioned previously, what what can I do to handle this exceptional condition right here instead of passing it further along? Especially in a case where, like you mentioned, even in your design of, of tickle, where the exception really shouldn't be happening because if the outcome is item potent, meaning performing the same action twice returns in the same outcome, then why is that an exceptional right. condition? Why should it be? Yeah, it was just and then why should you pass that up? Because you're just giving people useless information that they can't do anything about. Yes, I made something important that wasn't really important. That was my error. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's a big risk when we're designing systems that we can fall into that trap. So it's a good thing to watch out for. 
Maybe that's by the way you can don't make un, don't make unimportant things important, <laughs> and vice versa. So one of the mistakes people make in abstraction is they hide things that are important, that don't expose things that are really important. And then the module becomes really hard to use because you can't get at the stuff you need. You don't have the controls you need. You're not aware of the things you need. So again, it's all about, it's a two-way street where, again, you want to emphasize what's important. Don't hide that. And then hide what's unimportant. And by the way, ideally, you know, the best designs have the fewest number of things that are important, if you can do that. But it's like Einstein's old saying about everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Again, you can't just pretend something's unimportant when it really is. You have to figure out what really is important. That's right. And that takes creativity and, and effort. It doesn't just magically come to you out of thin air. Yeah. And insight and experience, too, in terms of knowing how people are going to use your system. And Yeah. I think that's important, too. Insight and experience as it pertains to design is, is going to be important. When you're first getting started, you, you're going to have more challenges. But the longer you do this, I imagine, I, I'm assuming this is your experience as well, is that it does become somewhat easier to design things as you go when they're similar to things you've experienced before. It, it does. One of the things I tell my students, I tell them, if, if you're not very experienced, figuring out what's important is really hard. You just you may not have the knowledge to know. And so then what do you do? And so what I tell people is, make a guess. Don't just, don't just ignore the question. Think about it. Make your best guess and commit to that. And it's like form a hypothesis and then test that hypothesis. You know, as you build the system, see, was I right or was I wrong? And that act of kind of committing, make a commitment. This is what I believe so far. And then testing it and then learning from it. That's how you learn. But if you don't ever actually make that mental commitment, I think try and figure it out, make your best guess and then test that, then I think it's hard to learn. Right. And what you're saying there, I think, is more than just test your implementation. It's test your design. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is makes a lot of sense. Another related thing I tell my students is, related to testing the design, is your code will speak to you if only you will listen. <laughs> and this gets at one of the things in the book that, that I think is most useful for, for beginners is red flags, that things you can see that will tell you that you're probably on the wrong track in terms of design, you may need, may need to revisit something. But becoming aware of those so that you can get feedback from your systems themselves. They would use what you can observe about a system in order to learn what's good and bad and also in order to improve your design skills. Absolutely. And there's a great list of some of those red flags at the, at the back of your book as a reference for, for people. You've mentioned a couple times the word modules. And maybe it would be helpful before we dig in a little bit more into modules and layers. What do those words mean when you use them to kind of help frame the, the upcoming section here? I think of a module as something that encapsulates a particular set of related functions. And I define modules really in terms of this complexity thing again. That's the way I think of them. The module is a vehicle for reducing overall system complexity. And the goal of a module, which I think is the same as the goal of abstraction, is to provide a simple way to think about something that's actually complicated. That's the idea. The notion that, that you have a very simple interface to something with a lot of functionality. And in the book, I use the word deep to describe modules like that. Thinking, of, I, I use the analog of a rectangle where the area of the rectangle is the functionality of a module and the, the length of its upper edge is the complexity of the interface. And so the ideal modules are those that have very small interfaces. So it's a very tall, skinny rectangle. Small interface and a lot of functionality underneath it. Shallow modules are those that have a lot of interface and not much functionality. And the reason that's bad is because that interface is complexity that the interface is the complexity that a module imposes on the rest of the system. And so we'd like to minimize that. So because lots of people will have to be aware of that interface, not so many people will have to be aware of any internal complexity of the module. Yeah, and I saw this early in my career, uh, and I still see it a lot, but not on systems I'm working on because I don't do it anymore. But in the early days, what you could call forms over data applications where it was, well, here's just a bunch of data entry screens, and then you can run reports. And when you do that, where does all the complexity reside? And where does all the tacit knowledge live? Well, it lives in the end users. So then you have these highly trained end users that when they leave the company, everybody gets terrified, because there went everything, and all the knowledge. And 
and now it seems that what we've done is we've said, well, let's at least move that complexity into the application. But it ends up in front end applications, which are now just having all that complexity inside them. And they're trying to orchestrate complex interactions with a bunch of different systems. And that's not really solving the problem either. So I imagine when you say module, you don't mean either of those two things. You mean get it get it even further down, further away, right? In other words, like you don't want the dashboard of your car controlling your engine timing. But it seems to me that's the state of a lot of web applications where the front end is controlling the system in ways that really the system should be owning that complexity on behalf of the front end or the end user. I think that sounds right. Again, you'd like to you'd like to separate the functions out so you don't have to have one place that has a whole lot of knowledge because that's going to be a whole lot of complexity for that one place. Now, it's a little hard in an application. A lot of stuff comes together at the top layer, the GUI layer. You know, so that layer may have to have at least some knowledge of lots of other parts of the system because it's combining all those together to present to the user. So it's a little harder, it's a little harder to get modularity or sort of deep classes when you're talking about the user interface layer. I th- and I think that's just part of that is just structural because of the nature of the uh, of what it does. But you'd like to have as little of the system as possible have that flavor. Hmm. So modules, you mentioned they're basically taking complexity and they're reducing the experience of that complexity in, 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 for the consumer of that module in a sense. You're hiding it, right. Right, right. Which goes back to the Parnas paper as well, which we'll link to in the show notes. And so then talk a little bit about layers and how those relate then to modules. I tend to think of layers as methods that call methods that call methods or classes that depend on classes that depend on classes. And so that creates potentially a layered system. Although Personally, when I code, I don't really think about layers that much. I don't think about a system as having discrete layers because the systems tend to be so complicated that that diagram would be very complex where you know sometimes layer A depends on layer B, and sometimes it may also depend on layer C at the same time while B depends on C. And that graph of usage to me has always felt very complex and, uh, and I'm not sure I really have to understand that so much. If you've really got modularity, that is, these classes encapsulate well, I think I would argue that, that that's a more important way of thinking about systems than in terms of the layers. Hmm. Well, it sounds like, too, when you're saying layers there, there's, there's a relationship to dependencies there. If a method has to call another method on another class or another interface, there's a dependency relationship there. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely, I would agree with those are important. It's just, it's very hard I think, to think systemically about all the dependencies. There's no way you could look at a complex system and in your mind visualize all the dependencies between classes. Right. Or necessarily have all dependencies have a certain classification of a certain layer, which kind right. of classic N-tier architecture tried right. to do. But maybe, in, if I'm understanding you correctly, maybe that's, uh, that's pretending we're dealing with complexity, but we're maybe actually not. Yeah, or just that systems, big systems really don't decompose naturally into perfect layers. Occasionally it works, you know, the TCP protocol is layered on top of the IP network protocol, which is layered on top of some underlying Ethernet transport system. So there the layering works pretty well, and you can think about three distinct layers. But in general, I don't think large software systems tend to break down cleanly into a perfect layer diagram. Yeah, and I think part of the reason you just mentioned, you know, TCP, I I think HTTP is another example of what I've read recently, you can call the narrow waste. And uh, that's another design approach to things is if everything boils down to byte streams or, or text, there's a narrow waste there. And from my experience, it seems that layering can really work really well in that kind of a context. But not every system that we're building necessarily has that narrow of a waste. And maybe layering yeah. doesn't quite apply as well in, in those other situations. I would say HTTP is a great example of a deep module. Mm-hmm. Pretty simple interface. The basic protocol is very simple, relatively easy to implement. And yet it has allowed tremendous interconnectivity in the, in the web and the internet. That so many different systems have been able to communicate with each other effectively using HTTP. It's a really great example of hiding a lot of complexity, making tremendous functionality possible with a pretty simple interface. Yes, and I would say it's also a classic example of just how much incidental complexity we can add on top of something that isn't itself necessarily complex. <laughs> Maybe the corollary here is that people will always find ways of, of making systems more complicated than you would like. Oh, that is absolutely true. Yes, especially when there's deadlines <laughs> involved. 
Okay, so I think we have a better understanding of modules and layers then. So maybe talk a little bit more about what it means that modules should be deep. Like you mentioned a second ago about, you know, they're sort of narrow and there's a simple interface. So explore that a little bit more for us so listeners can start thinking about how they can design modules that tend to be deep rather than shallow. Okay, so there's two ways you can think about a module. One is in terms of what functionality it provides, and one is in terms of the interface. But let's let's start with the interface, because I think that's the key thing. The interface is everything that anyone needs to know in order to use the module. And to be clear, that's not just the signatures of the methods. Yes, those are part of the interface, but there's lots more. You know, side effects or expectations or dependencies. You must invoke this method before you invoke that method. Any piece of information that a user has to know in order to use the module, that's part of its interface. And so when you're thinking about the complexity of the interface, it's important to think about all that. Functionality is harder to define. That's just what it does. Maybe it's the right way to think about a system with a lot of functionality. Maybe it's that it can be used in many, many different situations to perform different tasks. Maybe that's the right way to think about it. I don't have as good a definition. Maybe you have thoughts about how would you define the functionality of a module, you know, what makes one module more functional than another? Well, I think my, my first thought is it relates somewhat back to what you said before about, I call the technical empathy, but when you were referring before to the, the martyr principle, right, pulling complexity downward, the more complexity you can contain in a module through a simpler interface, I think would tend to add towards that richness and that depth. So, you know, for example, the power outlet is a wonderful example of an amazing abstraction. And, and I spend a lot of time thinking about it because it's a, a great way, I think, too, to help us think about how to simplify our software systems. I can plug any and all appliances into that simple power outlet. If I go to another country, I just need an adapter and I can still plug into it. And where's the power coming from behind it? Well, I don't know. I know the options, perhaps, but do I know exactly where this electron came from? I don't, right? So, in a, And there's a ton of complexity then that's encapsulated in that very simple interface. So for me, that that's how I kind of view as a deep module would be one that gives me a very simple interface by shielding me from a ton of complexity that I may want to think about and know about, right? For example, if I'm environmentally conscious, I may care about where my power is coming from. But when I go to plug in the vacuum, I'm probably not asking myself that question at that moment. Yes. Another way of thinking about it is really good modules, they just do the right thing. <laughs> Don't have to be told, they just do the right thing. Here's an example. I, I can tell you, I, I know for a fact what is the world's deepest interface. And what it is, it's a garbage collector. Because when you add a garbage collector to a system, it actually reduces the interface. It has a negative interface because you no longer have a free method you have to call. Before you introduced the garbage collector, you had to call free. Now you don't. There is no interface to a garbage collector. But it just sneaks around behind the scenes and figures out what memory is not being used and returns it to the pool so you can allocate from it. So that's an example of just do the right thing. I don't care how you do it. Just figure out when I'm done with memory and put it back in the free pool. That's a great point. So in that case, the interface is effectively zero from the standpoint of the end user. Although, you know, or maybe even negative. To, it's still maybe it's called GC suppress finalize when you're disposing, but that's a whole other conversation for another day. But yes. And, and you're right that it does hide a lot of complexity from you in that sense. You know, I think as well of, of you know, SQL databases that, that give you a what's well, supposed to be a simple human readable language, but the complexity of what it does under the covers of query planning and, and you know, which indexes to use and these sorts of things and trying to reduce table scanning. That's a lot of complexity that's shielded behind what, what is a much simpler language in comparison to what's actually happening under the covers. Oh, yeah. SQL is a beautiful example of a very deep interface. Another one, one of my favorites, is a spreadsheet. What an amazingly simple interface. I mean, if I just, we just have a two-dimensional grid in which people could enter numbers or formulas. You can describe it in, in, like that in three sentences. Now, of course, people have added lots of bells and whistles over the years. But the basic idea is so simple, and yet it's so incredibly powerful. The number of things people can use spreadsheets for is just astounding. It is. And Microsoft Excel now has a function called Lambda. And so therefore, spreadsheets are now Turing complete. <laughs> but interestingly, there with great power comes great responsibility. And I'm sure you've seen, as I have, some of the nastiest spreadsheets you could possibly imagine. And that's probably because design wasn't really a thought. It was just implement, implement, implement. I don't believe there is any way to prevent people from producing complicated systems. And sometimes, or for that matter, to prevent people from introducing bugs. And sometimes systems go out of the way to try and prevent people from doing bad things. But in my experience, as often as not, those systems also prevent people from doing good things. And so I think we should design to make it as easy as possible to do the right thing. 
And then not worry too much if people abuse it, because that's just going to happen. We can't stop them. I mean, you hope that with some code reviews, which from what we're talking to, it you know, suggests to me that your code reviews should also be design reviews. That those could, there'd be mechanisms to try to check this, but you can't be paranoid and try to prevent any and all bugs in, in your system, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So speak a little bit more to that. You know, I mentioned code review as a time not just for reviewing the code and the implementation, but also the, the design. So how do you encourage students or how have you experienced that before where you try to introduce a, a design review as well in the code review process? Well, to me, I just don't separate those. When I review people's code, if they ask me to review their code, they're getting design feedback as well. <laughs> now, you know, there may be times in a project where they just aren't in a position to take that design feedback and act on it. But when I review, I'm going to provide it anyway. And I would argue people should anyway, just so that people are aware about it. And even if you can't fix it today, you can put it on your to-do list that maybe when you get a little cleanup time after the next deadline, you can go back and get it. So I, I just, I feel like, Code reviews ought to be holistic things that look at, we want to find all of the possible ways of improving the software. We shouldn't limit it to just certain kinds of improvements. Yeah, I think that's a great way of looking at it. And and also recognizing that as you become more familiar with the design and you improve it over time, the, the design limits the cognitive burden because now you can have a sense of knowing, well, where am I in the system? Where does this code live within the system, right? And if you find code that's touching too many places in the system, that sounds to me like a design smell or, or what you call a red flag. Like yep, maybe that would be a red flag. About, yeah. yeah. I have to touch five modules in order to get this new functionality. Sometimes you have to do it, and that's the best you can do, but it's definitely a red flag. It's, that's the kind of thing where if I saw that, I would say, suppose, suppose I made the rule, we simply can't do this. I simply will not do this. What would happen? Would I have to simply shut the system down? Or could I find some other way that gets around this problem? And what's interesting is once, if you see a red flag and you say, suppose I must eliminate this red flag, you almost always can. Hmm. Yeah. And that's one of those things too, where you mentioned sometimes you have to touch five modules. The problem is when the sometimes becomes, well, this is just how we do it now. Because nobody stopped and did the design thinking to say, why are we having to touch five modules every time we need to make a change like this? Yeah, I'm not really good with the, the argument, well, this is how we do it. So <laughs> I realized that that may be a, a necessity in some environments, but well, and I didn't as even a design person, as an, I don't. And I didn't even necessarily mean as an argument, just more as a reality. Meaning, a reality, I think yeah. people, people become, th there's a sense where people's pain tolerance increases with familiarity. And so if you're touching the same five modules over and over again to make a certain kind of change without a design review or design thinking, I think people can just think that even if they don't state it, this is how we do it, it just becomes how they do it. As opposed to saying, could we simplify the design by putting all that complexity together in a module so that we're not having to touch five modules every time? Yeah, I'm, I'm more of a rip the bandaid off kind of person, but I, I want to constantly expose these things and get people thinking about them. But again, I recognize, well, if you're building a commercial product, there are certain constraints you have to work under. Sure. It's dangerous to let yourself, to let those become too ingrained in you to the point where you, you no longer realize the costs that they're incurring. Yeah, that's right. And that's where I think, again, those, having those red flags at the ready to be able to say, are we, are, we having, are we experiencing a red flag here? What can we do about it? And then comparing that to the pros and cons, because there's always trade-offs. And maybe you're not going to fix it today, but you know you're going to have to fix it soon. And then you start thinking, well, well, how can we do that incrementally and improve bit by bit instead of just accumulating the same mess over and over again? So let's talk now a little bit about, we've talked about interfaces to modules and modules themselves and what they do, but someday we actually have to implement something. So one of the design principles is that working code isn't enough. Now, this sounds like a challenge to me, and uh, I know you like putting challenges out there and, and making theories. So when I hear working code, I think of certain books like, you know, maybe clean code or, or certain aspects of the, you know, the agile methodologies that say, what we care about is working code, but you say it's not enough. So... Speak to that a little bit and how maybe that disagrees with what the broader prevailing wisdom might say. Well, who can object to code that works, first of all? So you might, you might think, <laughs> how, could I, how could I not be satisfied? That that's unreasonable. So, okay, so you're so swimming upstream here. So. <laughs> so what I would say is actually, yes, yes, working code is the ultimate goal, but it's not just working code today. It's working code tomorrow and next year and the year after that. What project can you point to and say, this project has already invested more than half of the total effort that will ever be invested in this project. It'd be hard to point to anyone. Most of your investment in software is in the future for any project. And so the most important thing I would argue is to make that future development go fast, as opposed to you don't want to make trade-offs for today that make your future development go more slowly. And so that's the key idea. 
that and that's what I call I, I call the the working code approach the tactical approach where we just focus on fixing the next bug or the next deadline. And if you add a few extra bits of complexity in order to do that, you, you argue, well, that's okay because we got finished faster. And I contrast that to the strategic approach where the goal is to produce the best designs so that in the future, we can also develop as fast as possible. And of course, other people use the word technical debt, which is a great way of characterizing this. You're basically borrowing from the future. When you code tactically, you're saving a little time today, but you're going to pay it back with interest in the future. And so that's why I argue for you should be thinking a little bit ahead. You need to be thinking about what will allow us to develop fast, not just today, but next year also. Yeah, I just had an episode a few months ago with Ipek Oskaya, and she co-wrote a book. She's from the, the IEEE, and we'll put a link in the show notes. Her book is called Managing Technical Debt. And you mentioned before the idea of investing in design, and a similar concept now too, is view this as an investment, and there's debt, and the debt will have interest, and you will need to pay that interest at some point. And so that concept relates very much to the concepts in that book. So speaking of, of technical debt and the, and the ways we tackle those things, you mentioned a second ago, the difference between being strategic and being tactical. And I'd like to explore that a little bit more because in the book, you coin one of my favorite phrases now, which is, is hard to avoid using too often, which is the idea of a tactical tornado. <laughs> so maybe explain for our listeners what a tactical tornado is, and then how good design can help prevent the tactical tornado syndrome. Every organization has at least one tactical tornado. I've worked with them. I bet you've worked with them. When I ask for a show of hands, when I give talks about how many of you have worked with tactical tornadoes, virtually everybody raises their hands. Actually, then I ask, how many of you think you might be a tactical tornado? And it's surprising <laughs> how many people will raise their hand. A tactical tornado is, is the ultimate tactical programmer. Do whatever it takes to make progress today, no matter how much damage it causes in the system. Often you see this, as, this is a person that will get a project 80% of the way working and then abandon it to go on to the next project. They do the, the first chunk, make tremendous progress and leave it to other people to clean up all the mess at the end. Or the person that will, you know, when there's a bug that needs to get fixed overnight, oh, they'll fix it. But they'll introduce two more bugs that other people have to come along later on. And, and what's ironic about them is often managers consider these people heroes. Oh, yeah, if I need something done in a hurry, I can just go to so-and-so. they will get it done. And then everybody else has to come along and clean up after them. And sometimes to those people, so I was like, I'm not getting any work done because I'm cleaning up so-and-so's problems. And so every organization has them. I just I think what you need is management that doesn't support those people, that recognizes, again, that these people are doing damage and not just not just fixing the bug, but also think about all the other damage they do. And I assume you've worked with tactical tornadoes over your career. Well, I think there's another category, which is recovering tactical tornadoes that you, you didn't mention. <laughs> meaning, Can you do an intervention with them? <laughs> well, meaning if you go back far enough in my career, there was a time where that moniker probably would have applied to me. But that's going way back. But I think that's another category is, you know, there's, there's individuals who are, you know, most people are trying to do the right thing, but maybe the incentives are, are not set up properly. Or the system, you know, the general system around them is maybe not oriented to help them, you know, fall into the pit of success, right? Or, or, or the tendency to do the right thing. So I imagine for a lot of people who are doing that, it's not necessarily that they're nefarious or they just want to pass off all their, all their work to somebody. There may be some. But I think for a lot of people, it's just the recognition of, we mentioned technical empathy before and things like this is, am I leaving bad things in my wake for the people behind me? And so I think you mentioned one is management support, but then I think also just a cultural ethos of, we try to build things that make other people's lives easier and not just do things that make me look good or, or make it easy for me. Yes. So I think education is a big part of that. You need to recognize what happens and talk to the people and explain the problems with their approach. And hopefully you can convert them. I had a humorous experience in a recent startup I was involved in where a new engineer came on board. We had a, a very strong culture of unit testing at the company. And so all our software had pretty much 100% code coverage unit tests. This engineer came in, apparently wasn't used to having unit tests. And he came in and said, wow, this is fantastic. I can make changes so quickly. And I just run the unit test and everything works. These unit tests are fantastic. And then after a week or two, when the person had pushed a bunch of commits, I went back and said, um, you haven't added any unit tests for the code you wrote. I said, oh, I need to write unit tests? <laughs> and somehow was not able to make the tie-in between the benefit he received from unit tests mm. and the importance of actually writing them. So we had a talk, and he started doing unit tests, and everything was fine after that. But it had just never occurred to him that he should also have to write unit tests. Oh, that's hilarious. Well, the, my other favorite is when people talk about refactoring, 
and they don't have test coverage. And I say, well, refactoring is changing the implementation without changing the external behavior. And and the even worse one is when they're changing the unit tests constantly. <laughs> when they change the implementation, it's going. Just think about that for a minute. If if somebody you know who was testing your automobile did that, would you really trust that car? You'd probably be terrified. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny how those things sneak in. But that that's a great point too, right? That that often people are teachable. Maybe they just don't know, they don't know better. And then having that team culture that says, this is how we do things, and then helping introduce people to it can definitely help. Another design principle regarding implementation, and I think some explanation here will be helpful. The increments of software development should be abstractions, not features. Now, we talked a second ago about how certain managers might really like those tactical tornadoes. And I imagine they might hear this and say, hold on a minute, you're telling me the increments, which I imagine you mean the deliveries of software development should be abstractions, not features. And they're going to cry out, where are my features? Well, okay, so like all design principles, this one doesn't apply everywhere. And of course, there are places where features matter. I listed this principle mostly in reaction to test-driven design, where in which you don't really do any design, you write a set of tests for the functionality you want. And then, which all of which break initially, and then the software development process consists of simply going through making those tests pass one after another until you eventually have all the features you want. And the problem with this is that there's never really a good point through the design. And so you tend to just kind of throw things together. This tends to be really bad designs. And so what I would argue is as much as possible when you're adding on to your system, try and do that by creating new abstractions. When you go and do it, build the whole abstraction. Don't just build the one tiny piece of the abstraction that you need right now. Think about, think about what the, the real abstraction would be. Now, that said, of course, there's the top level in your system where you're building features. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that system is going to be all about add, that part of the system is going to be all about adding features. But most of your system, hopefully, is these underlying modules that get used. Sure. Although, I guess it depends on how you define feature. But from my standpoint, it's, it's sort of like there is no spoon in the matrix. There is no features. Features are emergent properties of a composition of well-designed components, and that's just how the world works. So nobody, nobody's actually building features. But good, you know, good luck explaining this to <laughs> managers. Eyes glaze over, and they say, "But I want my features." It's, well, you'll get your features, but I, I guess I, you know, for me, I'd, I'd push this uh, this principle a little bit further and and say it's it's maybe closer to axiomatic from my perspective that it absolutely should be abstractions and and not features. But again, that that's also dependent on how you define feature, of course. Yeah, and again, this is a way of thinking about, I think, when you're doing agile design, again, as you, what are the units that you're adding on to your system? And that's why I would say this should mostly be abstractions. Yeah. So you talked about test-driven design uh, and, and there's TDD, which could mean test-driven development or test-driven design. So maybe talk about that a little bit more because that sounds like that could be controversial for some some listeners. You're, yeah, you're... Actually, actually, sorry, I misspoke. I meant test-driven development. Oh, okay. So you did mean the same thing. And, and so the implication there is that we have these tests and then we build our software, but that, that can lead to a bad design is what you're stating. Yes. I, I think it's highly likely to lead to a bad design. So I'm not a fan of TDD. Okay. I think it's better to Again, build a whole abstraction. And then I think actually better to write the tests afterwards. See, when I write tests, I tend to do white box testing. That is, I look at the code I'm testing and I write tests to test that code. That way I can make sure, for example, that, that every loop has been tested and every condition, every if statement has been tested and so on. So how do you avoid coupling your tests to the implementation in that kind of an environment? Well, there's some risk of that. But then I mostly argue, is that a problem or is that a feature? And so the, the risk of that is that when you make change in the implementation, you may have to make significant changes to your tests. And so that's not, that's not a bad thing, except that it's extra work. That's, I don't see any, the only problem with that is it just takes longer to, to do it. So as long as you're not doing that a lot, mm. as long as you're not having to massive refactoring your tests all the time, then, then I, I'm okay with that. But you know, this is an area in which I may dis- other people might disagree with me on this one. Yeah, and and this isn't the show where I, I push your ideas against mine, but that might be a fun conversation to have, in maybe another another context. But you, you did mention though that you you encourage starting with the abstraction and then writing your tests against that, and so that that does sound like that could lend also towards more you know opaque testing as opposed to you know testing the, the implementation directly. Yeah, again, I when I write tests, I don't actually test the abstraction. I tend to test the implementation. I, that's actually the way I tend to do it. And just because I feel like I can, I can test more thoroughly, if I don't look at the implementation at all, I think it's more likely that there are going to be things that I'm not going to notice to test. By the way, I will say there's a, the failure of my approach to testing, 
first, it's very good at catching errors of commission when you do something <laughs> you shouldn't do. It's not so good at testing errors of omission. That is, if you fail to implement something, then you're not going to test for it, and you won't notice that. And so if there's something you should be doing that your code doesn't do at all, this style of testing will not get that. Maybe if you test it from the abstraction, maybe you would think about that and maybe you'd write a test that would catch that. Well, and this is where I'll join your camp on TDD in the sense of, I think that's one of the, that's one of the struggles of TDD is I don't think it works once a system gets beyond a certain amount of simplicity because you just cannot conceive of enough tests to actually have the full functionality emerge. It's impossible. There's, there's diminishing returns on the amount of time you can spend defining those tests, and you will never have enough tests to have a full, complex system emerge from that. And, and as you pointed out, it can also lead to poor design. So listeners can definitely have fun interacting with you on your uh, Google Groups channel after the show about, <laughs> about TDD. Let's keep, there, it, keep there, it civil, people. <laughs> there is actually one place where I agree that TDD is a good idea, and that's when fixing bugs. Before you fix a bug, you should add a unit test that triggers the bug. Make sure the unit test fails, then fix the bug and make sure the unit test passes because otherwise you run the risk that you haven't actually fixed the bug. 100%. I'd also say, and I think you'll agree, that's another element of a good design is that you can do what you just described. And if you can't do what you just described, you should be asking yourself how to improve the design so that you can. Yeah, that says something is not testable somehow. Yeah, exactly. So testability is another hallmark and, and specifically what you just said, because I agree. If you can write a failing test that exposes the error condition first, then you have confidence when that test passes that you solve that problem. And of course, if your other tests still pass, you know you haven't accidentally broken something else, at least that was tested previously. You still, you still could have broken something else, but it wasn't something that you were testing previously. So it, it does increase your confidence, which is, which is good. Comments should describe things that are not obvious from the code. I have a feeling this principle might also be slightly controversial. This principle is controversial in that there seems to be a fairly large group of people who think that comments are not needed or even compliments are a bad idea. For example, Robert Martin in his book, Clean Code, which is, I think, one of the most popular books on software design. It's certainly way farther up the Amazon list of most of best-selling books than my book is, for example. He says, and I believe the direct quote is, every comment is a failure. Wow. And the implication is that if you had to write a comment, it means you failed to make everything clear from your code. Well, I disagree with this point. I think that fundamentally, it is not possible to describe in code all the things that people need to know in order to understand that code. You simply cannot do that. And that's the purpose of comments. So for example, in an interface, there are certain things you cannot describe in comments. If one method must be called before another one, there's no way in, in any modern programming language where you can describe that in the code itself. And there's just many other examples. If you look at any piece of code, there are things that are important that people need to know that simply can't be described in the code. And so if you want to have abstraction, if you really want to hide complexity, you have to have comments to do that. The alternative is you have to read the code of the module in order to understand it. That's not, if you have to read the code, then you're exposed to all of that internal complexity. You haven't hidden any complexity. So I, I'm a very strong advocate of comments. Now, I recognize that people sometimes don't write good comments. And you know, the flip side of this is that the other mistake you can make is writing a comment that simply duplicates what's in the code. You know, we've <laughs> yeah. all seen the comment, add one to variable i, followed by the statement i equals i plus one. Yes. Those comments are useless. Yes. Because they're simply repeating what's in the code. Or another example, I bet you've seen this, every developer's seen, you go and you read the documentation. And you read the, for example, the, the Java docs for a method or the docs in documentation. And there will be a method called handle page fault. And what will the comment at the top say? Handle a page fault. Yeah. So what has that comment added that wasn't already obvious from the code? The word A. There's no useful information there. So this is a dual -ed double-edged sword. It's really important to think about what is not obvious from the code and document that. At the same time, don't waste your time writing comments to simply repeat what you can get from the code. So when you're documenting a method, use different words from the variable name. Don't use the same words. Or worse, the comments don't match what the implementation actually does, which I think is part of the reason that Robert Martin might speak against that. But the ability to make bad comments 
is not a reason to have no comments. I think is that's something right. You would and there's a with. risk. There's a risk that comments can become stale. That's one of the four excuses people use for not writing comments. They say they're going to become stale anyway, so why bother? But in my experience, it's not that difficult to keep comments mostly up to date. There will occasionally be errors, but almost all the comments will still be accurate. Yeah. And if people are using the software and are using the documentation to help them know how to use the software, then that can also be a way to keep them up to date if they're not reflecting reality any longer. Right. And the other thing is to think about where you put your comments, which is you want the comments as close as possible to the code that they're describing so that if you change the code, you're likely to see the comment and change it also. Right. Which I would argue is true for all documentation, meaning the closer your documentation lives to the abstractions and implementations, the better and the more likely it will be kept up to date. So one last principle that I want to talk about before we wrap up, uh, software should be designed for ease of reading, not ease of writing. I think this definitely relates to some things we've said previously, but talk a little bit more about what does that mean, ease of reading versus ease of writing, and how does that play out in software systems in your experience? Well, there are various shortcuts you can often use that make code a little bit easier to write, but make it harder to read. Two classic examples, pet peeves of mine about C++. The first one is the keyword auto, which you can use to say, I'm not going to tell you what type of variable this is. You, madam compiler, please figure it out on your own and just use the right type. It's super convenient and easy to use. But now when somebody reads the code, they have no way of, they have to go through themselves basically and repeat the compiler's mechanism to try to figure out what type of thing this is. Another one is standard pair, this pair abstraction with a first and a second. Super easy if you need to return two values from a method, just return a pair. But the problem now is that everybody's referring to the elements of this result as result.first and result.second. And who knows what those actually are, in fact. So the code was a little bit easier to write. You didn't have to spend the time to define a custom structure to return these things, but it's much harder to read. Not putting comments in is another example. It makes it faster to write the code, but harder to read. And there's, there's a variety of other things. So I just, if you just keep that in mind and, and ask yourself, is, am I making this code as easy as possible to read? Even if it takes you more time as a writer, the thing is that code will be read a lot more times than it was written. And so it pays for itself. The code will be read a lot more often than it's written. And also the maintenance life cycle of the code will vastly exceed the development life cycle of the code. You know, one of the problems I think people forget, people forget that they forget. When they're writing the code, they, they don't think about the fact that even if I come back to this in three months, I'm not going to remember why I did this. Yeah, that's right. That's why it's so important sometimes to do a git blame on code and then recognize that you are the one who did it, right? That's just, it's a very important experience for everyone. Who wrote this terrible code? Get blame. Okay, Ouch. I'm going to be quiet now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Very important experience. John, anything else that you want to cover that maybe we've missed or, or any closing thoughts? No, I think you've covered just about everything. This has been a really fun conversation. I agree. And I definitely encourage listeners to get your book. And my understanding too is there's a Google group that they can join if they want to continue the conversation with you from here. That is correct. I think it's called Software Design Book at googlegroups.com. Great. And we'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes as well. If listeners want to find you on Twitter, is it John Osterhout at John Osterhout? Uh, yes, I believe that's right. They can always just Google me too, and that'll probably get them started on finding me. But, I, but I'm on Twitter, yep. And I'm happy yeah. to take email. As I said at the beginning, I don't claim to have all the answers. I'm still learning myself. The act of teaching the course has actually changed my opinions about software design in a few ways. And so I'm eager to continue learning. So if there are things you see in the book that you think are wrongheaded, I'd love to hear why you think that. Or if you have other design ideas that you think are really important that I haven't mentioned, I'd love to hear those as well. And if you think there's a parallel universe, getting back to our very leading off question about whether design is absolute or relative, if you think there's an alternative universe of design that is totally disjoint from what I talk about and yet a really good world, I'd love to hear about that as well. Awesome. Awesome. I, I love that perspective. I, I love your temperament and your desire to just learn. And I think the ability to be a lifelong learner is a critical skill, I think, in our industry. So thanks for just demonstrating that for us in, in the way you approach these things. Well, thanks for the conversation. I've enjoyed it. All right. Well, everyone, thanks so much for joining John and I today on Software Engineering Radio. And this is Jeff Doolittle. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. 
This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.